Borderline personality disorder is considered the most destructive of all mental health disorders. As many as 10% die. They die because of, of, of a self-perpetuating, um, self-aggravating, um, self self-enraging mental condition where they get so upset that they will either die because of recklessness or die because they're attempting suicide in order to get someone's attention or to actually punish them, as bizarre as that sounds. Of all borderlines, one out of 10 will die. That is a very dangerous and highly pathological psychological disorder. Um, the suicide rate for borderlines is 10%, which is, which is the highest death rate of all mental health disorders. Um, the suicide rate is, is so high because borderlines lose control and lose the ability to be rational. Um, if they feel, for example, remember borderlines are afraid of abandonment. Let's say a borderline finds out that their partner um, cheated on them. That is, that is the nightmare that came true and they become overwhelmed by rage and, and borderlines will either turn on a person and potentially hurt them and, and murder rates are high with, uh, by borderline partners, but sometimes they turn on themselves. They feel so worthless and angry, they want to punish um, their partner. And it's paradoxical because they don't really want to die. Uh, they want to sh um, cause harm to that person that hurt them. And the best way to harm that person is to try to kill yourself because that causes guilt, that causes shame and fear. So borderlines use that to manipulate, control, and punish. The problem is that they are not thinking rationally during these moments of rage, and they go too far. When someone talks to a borderline who attempted suicide, almost always they will tell you they never wanted to die. They just lost control of their emotions. Unlike uh, disorders like major depression or bipolar disorder, there's a, um, there's a slow descent into a dark, deep abyss where you lose hope forever feeling good or happy or loved again, and you want to end the pain, and you commit suicide. The borderline, in a fit of rage, hurts themselves in order to get attention, to bring to either punish, like I said, paradoxically punish someone, or to try to bring them back to the relationship. But in their rage, the borderline has no insight into what they're doing. They feel, uh, they feel justified. They feel completely confident that the person who crossed them deserves it. But once you go through the cycle, there is regret and shame, and they're acutely aware of, who they, of how much they hurt that person. They feel guilty and shame. Unlike um, a narcissistic personality disorder or an antisocial personality disorder, where you don't ever connect completely with how badly you hurt the person, borderlines have, there's a window a time where the borderlines connect with what they did to that person and feel acute distress, guilt, and shame. Well, if we look at the borderline and their highs and lows, what we need to, what we need to really take into account is that they are offer, often, if not continuously, preoccupied with the potential for abandonment. Even the most benign events, um, if, if perceived or experienced as negative, will be twisted and, and, and be experienced as abandonment. And when a borderline feels abandoned, they explode. And they explode with anger and rage um, in a way, um, paradoxically, to defend themselves, to create a sense of strength and power. And they hurt the people they most love. Now, the reason I wrote my book, The Human Magnet Syndrome, Why We Love People Who Hurt Us, is to show codependents, those who are perpetually in relationships with people that hurt them but claim to love them, that there is a way out. You can't solve a problem unless you know what it is. And, and once a codependent understands that there's something about them, something about their personality that draws them to the borderline, or what I call the pathological narcissist, then there is hope for them to get help. That is a psychological foundation upon which therapy rests. When a codependent comes to me or other therapists to finally work on those wounds, those psychological distortions that compel them to stay, in relationship with the borderlines, or be continuously attracted to them, therapy has a chance to work. There's a very strong shame element of the BPD's behavior. When they rage, 
that they believe hurt them. But when they're not enraged or when they're not upset, they're able to pull it together and show the world this kind, loving, upbeat uh, persona. Um, and it's very difficult if you don't live with the borderline or you're not witness to the ups and downs to recognize them. They can be the most charming, lovable, or affable people. If the borderline falls in love with intense abandon to people they just met and they project these fantasies of perfection. And they, and they let go of any preconceptions that time um, um, and uh, effort will ultimately build a foundation to build a relationship. The borderline is all or nothing. And when a codependent uh, meets a borderline, there's an explosion of love, an explosion of intense, what we call limerence, this feeling where you can't sleep, you can't eat, you don't feel comfortable until you're with that person. The borderline gets lost in that intoxication. And to, the, and to their partner, the codependent, it is a reciprocal feeling. There is nothing manipulative about it. They are just caught in a whirlwind of love. The problem is the borderline's love or infatuation happens so quickly, um, it can't be sustained. One is it's a fantasy. Two is both the borderline and the codependent coexist, as I said before, as dance partners, as two individuals who really are suffering psychologically, but they don't know it. So the person who is naturally all about other people's needs, the codependent, is naturally going to be attracted to, unconsciously, to a borderline, and the borderline is going to be pulled towards um, the codependent. So consciously, the borderline is attracted to the physical uh, traits um, um, or the observable traits of the codependent and vice versa. They're not aware that there's something wrong with them. They just fall in love. These type of individuals always find each other because if the codependent was healthy, they would have a gut feeling. I mean, and this is where it's unconscious, but something would feel wrong. And that is why a healthy people, when they start a relationship with a borderline, one is they're not initially attracted because of the human magnet syndrome, but even if they are attracted and they do fall for the alluring nature of, of the borderline, they quickly realize the person's not stable after the first one or two meltdowns. The borderline sees the world in black and white. They're very deeply damaged individuals who, as a child, were, uh, as a child, sustained emotional and physical abuse. So at their very core, unconsciously, beyond their awareness, they do not feel valued for who they are. But when they fall in love with someone, in that moment, someone loves them completely, a love that they've never experienced, so it's explosive, it's wonderful, all-encompassing. All they know is how good they feel. But it's not stable love. But once the borderline fantasy is challenged through an argument, through a disagreement, and sometimes by just an odd gesture, the borderline goes back to their, unconsciously, they go back to their shame base and they feel abandoned, and that rage, that contempt, that anger that comes from repressed memories of childhood comes through in their rage. So they goes from devaluation or hatred and quickly will eventually cycle in maybe a period of two hours, sometimes in a couple days, back to the same intense love. But, but let me be really clear. You don't have to be codependent to, uh, to be stuck in a relationship with a borderline. For example, um, you can be married to a borderline, get married very quickly, because remember, relationships start quick, and then the borderline, because of fear of abandonment, can uh, manipulate the situation and, um, and use pregnancy as a way to keep a person from abandoning them. Now you stay in the relationship because you don't want to leave the child um, who, is, uh, um, who, is, um, you're, who you worry about can be a victim to the borderline. So there's all sorts of manipulative strategies that borderlines entrap individuals. I mean, sometimes it's very, very difficult to break free from a borderline, especially when there's a child or your, your finances are commingled or you, the borderline has power. Because remember, if a borderline feels abandoned or hurt, they will hate you with a sense of ferocity that they will go after you and things you value most. Children, money, possessions. Borderlines, like many other personality disorders, have one similar symptom, is they're not aware that they have a problem. In fact, it's a primary um, symptom that we use to understand 
or delineate between someone with a personality disorder or someone who does not have one. And that is the ability to have insight into who you are and how you impact people. People with borderline personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, and antisocial personality disorder or sociopathy, as I call in my book, Emotional Manipulators, are not conscious of uh, having problems. So they project blame onto other people. So if, if, you, if you don't think you have a problem, the odds are you're not gonna seek help. But if a borderline explodes out and hurts and damages people around them, and, and afterwards, after the, the tornado hits, and they see what they've done, then they experience guilt and shame, and they will agree to go to therapy. The problem is it's hard to keep a borderline in therapy because that liability, as we call in the psychiatric field, that explosiveness uh, plays out in therapy. There is therapy types and therapy procedures that do work well with borderlines, but th that is long-term therapy. For example, like dialectical behavioral therapy for treatment. That works, but you have to engage the borderline and have them motivated to work in therapy. More often than not, borderlines not only think they don't have a problem, but they believe that if, if their partner quits upsetting them, everything will be fine. That is, uh, that is a bold-faced distortion and very difficult to work in, in a therapy relationship. Borderlines, when they are enraged or experiencing this, what we call narcissistic injury or abandonment um, injury, um, they are out of control at rage. It's as if they're reliving the abuse that happened to them. It's an explosive, um, um, explo it's an explosive reaction that, uh, which they have no control over. Once they cycle through that, when the situation calms down, they have a better sense of what they did, and then they start to feel bad. And then they start to feel ashamed. And then they start to try to make up for the problem. And there's, there's a cycle. And then they beg for forgiveness. And they promise they will never hurt that person again. And then they connect to the love that they have with that person. And then they, they love them with the same intensity as they did before the blow-up. And the cycle goes around and around and around. So the borderline, in the moments of rage, hates the person with intensity beyond description. And when they are beyond that, they, they want forgiveness and ultimately want to connect and love that person.